Hello and thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, my thanks to Singularity University and to the Federation of Thai Industries for putting on such an amazing meeting. I'm sure you're all enjoying it. I'm enjoying it too. Um, my journey, I, I'm going to talk today about additive manufacturing, also known as 3D printing and medical devices, and really focus on three key areas to leave you with three, three topics. Uh, personalization, uh, decentralization, and biomimicry. So we've heard those topics, we've heard those words said in many different areas. Um, my journey with 3D printing started actually 25 years ago, uh, if you can believe it. In 1993, I had the, uh, the introduction to the stereolithography process and spent really my whole career focused on kind of medical problems and, and figuring out how 3D printing could solve surgeons' problems, real-world problems of patients needing surgery and making it better. Um, the, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, kind of why, you know. So we, we spent a bit of time focused on, you know, the technologies and applications in all kinds of different areas, but for medical, why, you know? And part of the big why, and I think Scott Summit did a good, I, a good job of uh, explaining this yesterday, is the fact that we're all unique. So not one of us in this room is, uh, is sim you know, is the same as one, uh, one other in this room. And based on the fact that we're unique, we have a kind of an innate, uh, an innate demand or desire for personalization. And if I asked you if you had a choice to choose a personalized car or a regular car, how many would choose a personalized car, you know, in this room? Many of us. I think we have a, you know, it says something about being made just for you. Uh, so personalization, the first key. Second key, um, there's a key about, you know, the fact that we all deserve, no matter where we are in the world, no matter what uh, family we're born into, we all have a, a, uh, an innate need and, and really, uh, um, you know, a, a key element of us as humans is that we deserve quality medical care. And I think this was, there were some great talks yesterday on kind of reaching out to the world beyond, you know, the world that we live in and focusing on how we can use tools to help those that are underprivileged. And I think here, decentralization of manufacturing or democratization of manufacturing really is a key part of how um, these tools, specifically added manufacturing, can be used to help provide the best quality care for anybody. And the third piece is really the future. You know, so if we think about the, the, uh, the future in the big picture, uh, regenerative medicine, if you've heard that term, really focusing on building body parts to replace our body parts, you know? Much of what we'll see, much of what I'll show is about building parts to replace a damaged part, but the part we're replacing the damaged part with looks nothing like the original part. It looks like a metal part or a plastic part. Here, we really focus on things that are, that are gonna look like, in the end, when you place a regenerative medicine part in your body, it's gonna turn into the part it needs to turn into. So we'll talk about biomimicry and how additive is kind of helping that area. So to start, um, you know, I'm going to use uh, additive manufacturing and 3D printing kind of simultaneously. So they, to me, they're very similar to each other. The, the term, so the consensus term now for ISO and ASTM is actually additive manufacturing, but the world knows uh, it is 3D printing. And I'm always amazed. I mean, yesterday, I'm sitting through the talks yesterday, and we're hearing talks about uh, producing meat and we're hearing talks about making guides and all kinds of other things. Um, and I'm always amazed at how much interaction there is between different people using the same technologies, but for completely different purposes. So for making meat, there was a need to make va vessels and to make vascular structures. And for making bridges, there was a need to, to have stress and strain control over knowing that that bridge is strong enough. And the same thing exists in the medical, in the medical area. And I think, uh, you know, on the right, so on the left, you see the first process that was ever developed called stereolithography. Uh, on the left, uh, sorry, on your left, stereolithography. On the right, you see a process called electron beam melting, which was one of the first processes developed for making metal parts, which are now commonly made today in several industries, and medical is one of those. So on the right, you see uh, actually something like 200 spinal cages being produced at one time. So we'll talk first about personalization. I think it's key, you know, it's key that uh, medical and additive have been a good fit together for many years because of the fact that we're all unique and if you wanted to make a unique product just for you, you're gonna have a lot size of one. 
you know, and I think this room is very well versed in manufacturing, and typically, you know, lot sizes of one are a problem, you know, and a, and a challenge. With 3D printing, it really is less of a, less of a problem. So I'm going to focus in, in, uh, on kind of four, four areas. These, don't, these aren't necessarily um, broken out to be broken out this way, you know, over, overall, but I'm going to focus on four areas where additive and medical have played a role together to allow for personalization. Uh, the first being uh, anatomic models, and then we'll talk about orthotics and prosthetics some. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about implants, which is a kind of a key area, and then we'll focus on, uh, on an area that we call virtual surgery and templating. So one thing to understand about any of these things that are going to be personalized is that we first need to have your data, you know, we need to measure you somehow. And so the way that's done, and you probably figured this out already, is we take an x-ray or a CT scan or an MRI and we use that and we get a very accurate picture of your insides that we're going to use to guide surgery. Um, that image comes out in kind of a two-dimensional view, you know, in the middle here, this is a typical, you know, typical CT image here of a, uh, of a kidney, and it's coming out in a way that is, uh, is two-dimensional, so stacked two-dimensional images. It's not really helpful for making something three-dimensional without that extra dimension. So this process would take and extract only the relevant information, which here is vessels and a tumor and a kidney, and then we're going to use that to guide the rest of the process. So in this case, we made a model of the kidney with a tumor, but you'll see different applications ahead. But just to give you an idea of how, how the imaging starts. Now, many of these models historically are of bone, bone structure, because um, the bones are, are stable, the, the surgeons are cutting and moving them around, and uh, it was decided very early on that it was a good, a good fit. So you'd see models of a skull, a child born with a, a major cleft in the face, models of, uh, of other bones of the body, and even models of surgery that has already been performed. So the model on the right shows the spine, but the blue is actually the hardware or the implants that are already in place from a previous surgery. And they've now got to go back and do a second surgery. So models are a physical thing in the hand. And on the left here, you see a heart. So things moved from, uh, you know, originally being mostly about hard tissue, or what we'd say the bone structure, to, to things like hearts. You know, so on the left, a model of a heart to aid a surgeon. This is a, a pediatric heart, so this is real size of the blood chambers of a heart, of a pediatric case, so a child that needs surgery in a very, uh, in a very fast manner to save the child's life. So having that heart in the hand is very, uh, is very important. And on the right, you see a kidney. Again, looking, uh, you can't see it very well in this image, but a tumor kind of in the top, uh, in the top area of this kidney, and the surgeon's going to use that. To, to think a little bit more and to see the orientation of these structures relating to each other. And while these models are, you know, are colorful and interesting to look at, they're, they're, you know, they're accurate. So they're a one-to-one -one representation of you and of what the surgeon's going to see only when they get into you in surgery to fix the problem that you're having. And uh, you'll see many different vari varieties, some of which are plastic and some of which are uh, different materials. And these things, so the question is, what, what do they do? You know, why use them? And uh, there's a couple of key pieces. So for models themselves, we see them being used before surgery most times. So this is for the surgeon primarily, but also for the patient, uh, where your surgeon comes to you and says, this is you and I'm going to cut, and I'm going to move things around a little bit, and this is exactly what it's going to look like, it means something different to you than just explaining it with words, you know, seeing it, holding it different. Uh, and on the right, models actually used in surgery. So I'll, I'll disclaim, I see some faces, I, I'll disclaim there is some blood in my talk today. So I haven't seen much blood yet, but uh, 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 bear with me. I think that, you know, these models being used in surgery and as implants, the blood actually kind of makes it real. You know, these are real parts that are being used for real purposes. So on the right, um, on the right models being used in surgery. So here's a case of a child born in Africa, has a problem called Cruzon syndrome. Um, it's where some of the sutures of the skull close prematurely, and so the, they need to go in and do surgery. In a lot of the world, this surgery would be done as a baby, but in, in this part of the world where this patient was born, they didn't have surgery. So it's now a life and death situation where there's too much pressure in the brain, and the eye's about to lose sight because of the pressure on the nerve, and so the model is used before surgery um, in 
on the back table to actually do surgery before going into surgery and doing it the second time. So the key here is that the model is a practice round, you know, and how many of us would like our surgeon to have a practice test before they come and do our, our surgery? You know, I think I would. I think most of us would. Um, so I'll move on to talk about another case that's really special to me. This is a case of two boys that were from Egypt, and they were born with a big problem, and they were joined together at the head. And so this case actually had a lot of news. You may have seen it even here in Thailand. Um, these boys came to the U.S. in search of someone to help separate them. So a surgeon and a team got together. Models were made of many different types to facilitate kind of the planning surrounding a big case. So you can think of some of these surgeries as fairly small things. This is a big one. There's 30 plus people that are coordinating just about these two boys. So models that included, you know, two meter long models of, of a whole, you know, so a 3D printed model that was two meters long of the whole body of the boys and things like skin and brains and bone and the like so they could really practice the whole thing. And the goal being that in physically, you know, they're going to take and plan physically and they're going to transfer it. So here actually, just one little step of the surgery, which is where they're going to make the incision, which you can think of it, the incision line is going to be very important here because in the end, these boys that are in a bed that, as I looked at, I thought about this yesterday, should have been 3D printed, but the bed wasn't 3D printed, but could have been 3D printed today, uh, but in a bed and they're transferring that plan from the, the model straight to the patient in a very tactile way. Uh, so in the end case, this model's used in surgery. Uh, two walking, talking boys was the end of that, pro you know, the end of 35 hours in surgery. So were the models a key part of it? They were. The neurosurgeon said the model was the biggest kind of piece of information they had and was really key to doing it well. Um, other areas, you know, we talk about here about kidneys. And this is a model of a kidney with a tumor. So the pink part is actually the big bulbous part here in the front is a tumor in the kidney. So it's a big problem. And they don't want to take the whole kidney out, so they're going to go and just take the tumor out. This next video is showing actually the Da Vinci robot. So you, you've heard about the robot being used for prostate and for other surgeries. Um, so here that robot's going to be used, but what they're going to do first is actually do robot surgery on the model. So the left side is the model being used in the same robot the morning before surgery, and then they're going to go to surgery, and they're going to do surgery on the right side. Apologies for the blood, again, but to give you some feeling for, uh, for the gravity of it, and they get, again get to practice. So they use the exact same tools, and they do it before they go actually in and do it later. Really key. Scott Summit yesterday did a great, a great job of talking about his, his previous work, and Scott was uh, really ahead of his time. And, uh, you know, I'd say that he, he's, in, he's got an amazing mind and an amazing mind for design. And uh, some of his work lives on through, you'll notice that he and I both sold our companies to 3D Systems. So Scott and I actually worked together, we're colleagues for many years, but worked together for one year on uh, the same company. And some of his work lives on through a company called Unique, building products that are individualized to allow for something that's a disability to be more of a, a fashion statement, you know, which is kind of an amazing, an amazing thing and really powered here by 3D printing. On the, on the right, showing a, a 3D printed socket. And these parts, um, you know, not only, uh, not only are, are interesting to look at, but they're clearly functional. And as we, we heard yesterday, as Scott talked about scoliosis, this brace, its purpose, sorry, the brace, its purpose is to stabilize the spine so it doesn't get worse. So they put the stabilizer on, and if you wear it, in a couple of years, you, may, you maybe didn't get worse, you don't need surgery. But if you didn't wear it, it gets worse and worse and worse, and then you need surgery. So key here is that you want to make it look good and be breathable. You also want to put sensors in it to know whether it's working, you know? So is it stabilizing the spine, and is the patient wearing it? So these, these, um, you know, got these uh, braces now have sensors built into them, you know, accelerometers and other things to tell whether they're actually doing the job they want to do, and providing that as a feedback loop to the next guide, you know, the next brace to make sure that it's, it's even better. And just to think of, you know, the different types of things that are done and, and again, taking a disability and making it something that people want to talk about on social media, you know, which I think is kind of an amazing thing. And I think really there are a few pieces to this, but a key part of it is that additive manufacturing kind of allows the flexibility to make things as beautiful as you can, as your mind can imagine them. 
Okay, so we'll move into the implants. Um, implants has been a key area for additive manufacturing. This is a patient that had a uh, bilateral hip surgery, so both hips. The one side now is moved. This is dislocated, so this is bad. So they need to go in and take this out. It's literally free floating up in the pelvis. So they're gonna put in a new device that's patient matched just for you. Uh, the next slide's got some graphic surgery images, but that piece is put into the patient and would fit, uh, would fit perfectly. Other application areas, the, uh, the head and neck has always been a really good fit for these technologies. I think our face, you know, you care about how it looks. You, we care about how it looks. The surgeon cares that it's symmetrical and that it looks the way it should look. The hip, you don't need it to look good. You just need the hip to function. But here in the face, you need it to look good. So a lot of the applications in the head and neck for personalized implants like uh, jaw joint replacements and cranioplasties are about not only the form, um, obviously the function of covering, say, covering the skull, but also the form to make you symmetrical again. And in other areas, you'd see it being used for the orbit and the mandible and, and many different areas. Uh, great applications of using these technologies, again, to personalize things for, for one given patient. Now, one of the key areas that's kind of moved the technology forward is something that we call virtual surgery. And, and, and using virtual surgery in combination with templates. So the, the concept's fairly simple in that you plan the surgery digitally, so you plan in the computer, and then the way you get that plan from the computer to the patient is by a 3D printed guide. So in this case, these, the plan would look like taking out a tumor and replacing it with some bone and some implants, but the way you transfer that is by making guides that are actually gonna be fit onto the patient to take part of the fibula the long bone in your leg that in this case is gonna be taken out and fashioned into a new jaw bone. And the way you do that is by using 3D printed guides after you've done planning. So this is applied not only to areas like that, but to other areas like, uh, like the cranium. So here's a child with a problem and that the head shape, the sutures have closed at strange times and they've got a, a head shape that's not conducive to growing properly. So they've gotta take the head basically take the whole cranium off. This is a, an amazing surgery to watch live because you couldn't think this is possible to do, but they take the cranium off, reshape the cranium, put it back onto the kit, you know? And again, templates are the transfer mechanism for taking the plan and getting to the actual surgery. And these are life or death kinds of things. I mean, these are major things. There are other things that are done quite a bit. I mean, many of you wouldn't know that uh, you know, around the world, total knee replacement. How many in the room have a total knee replacement? Anybody in the room? A few? Or a hip? I mean, it's, it's quite common. So at, knees and hips are the most commonly replaced joints in the body. And they are, the knee is replaced about a million times a year worldwide. So one million cases a year. And something like, so the same concept of planning, where you take an x-ray, a CT scan, or an MRI, use it to guide placement, of standardized implants, so here the implant's standardized, but you're placing it in a custom way using a guide. So you can think of it like a jig, a manufacturing jig, to place a custom, you know, to place a screw, to place something in a custom way. Uh, in this case, you're placing that custom thing in your knee, and you're guiding, you know, between the hip and the ankle, you're kind of guiding everything, and today, many times, uh, guides are used. So something like 150,000 times a year out of that million, 150,000 times a year, surgeons are using guides that are 3D printed to kind of take and, and do that surgery better. Many of those things, I won't spend much time talking about kind of AR and VR and MR. We heard a great, you know, a few great talks here about those technologies, but they do have application here for, in some ways, allowing the surgeon maybe to be more integrated in the planning process. So they're a way of communicating that it's kind of like, uh, I think Dara was saying yesterday, getting rid of CAD. Somebody was saying getting rid of CAD, you know, so they just want to design something. Um, and how do I do that in a way that's uh, conducive to a surgeon wanting to look at it and do it himself? And I think part of the way these technologies are there uh, to do that. And I think once you've done the workflow for taking, uh, for taking and creating the uh, data to 3D print, it's easy to take and push some of that toward AR and VR. Second, second big point. So first, personalization. Second big point, uh, decentralization. So this is really about democratizing access. And I think that we, you know, we can look at all kinds of examples. We've heard, 
we've heard this term used a lot, and I think it's great that it's being applied, and we're all applying it in different ways to different industries. Here, it's really about, you know, kind of the historical way that obviously most things that we, we eat, most things that we buy used to be made very close by to where we are, and over time, they've become more, of, more decentralized, and some of them have moved to a really centralized model. So, in the implant industry, most implants that were used for hips and knees and other things come from a very small number of companies, you know, worldwide. And they come from, uh, you know, they come from Germany and the U.S. and other places, and they move around. And uh, the key is, could we do it better, you know, and could we do it better for a couple of different reasons by doing it more local? And I think 3D printing is one of those tools that can help for this decentralization and likely most helping the underserved populations that are in places that don't have access or have less access. So where we're seeing this, so kind of the baby steps of this, you know, it's got to take a while to get to that point. The baby steps of this are we're seeing hospitals, and I'm, I'm in the U.S., and, and hospitals we're seeing adopt these technologies inside of the hospital to actually produce some of these things that they need themselves. So the, really the hospital and the surgeon is becoming the manufacturer, you know, and the hospital becomes its own manufacturing center. Um, what kinds of things might we see? I think that uh, the, the sky's the limit. I mean, really, any of the things you've seen, any things we talk about in medical, could eventually be made locally. Uh, some things are very uh, easy to see, like a lot of the things we'll talk about next in regenerative medicine. I think when you're making something that's made out of your tissue, your bone, your, your skin, potentially that's gonna be local. You know, you're not gonna get that from, from uh, you know, three towns away or two countries away. You're gonna make that locally. Um, but you're seeing here, this is a survey that was put out last year, I think, and I, I think you're seeing some of the data showing that models and guides and implants are key. And over time, I think you'll see more and more implants being made and more and more of the things that are uh, regenerative medicine. I think this, is, so this is my one exponential slide. I don't have the current, the current number, but it would actually grow. So I, I have no doubt that by 2018, it actually doubled. But this is, a, this is looking at hospitals with a centralized lab using one of the main tools that's, uh, that's used in this is a software tool called Mimics. But it's a pretty, good, uh, a pretty good indicator of what's happening. And what's happening is, even without uh, this, the external stimulation of being able to get reimbursed for some of these things, hospitals are doing this because they see that it makes a difference and they see that it's going to make a big difference later. And I think that uh, it's a trend, and what the 16 of 20 hospitals here that are kind of the key teaching centers, many of the hospitals will follow those, you know, are following that teaching center model. And really, the 3D printer is just an enabler, you know, so it becomes a tool. And I think, uh, borrowing from Jason, I think this, the, the magic box idea from yesterday from the space station is a really good analogy here, too. The surgeon doesn't care what comes out of the magic box, but it, he, he cares, but he doesn't need to know how it works. He just needs to know that for tomorrow's surgery, something's gonna come out of the magic box. And I think that same analogy works, works pretty well here. And it can either be personalized or not personalized. It wouldn't have to necessarily be one or the other. So that's the second point, decentralization. Third point, uh, biomimicry. Um, so here, you know, we're focused on, on really you know, all around us are these amazing, um, amazing examples. Our bodies are great examples, but in nature, we'd see amazing examples. You know, here are some uh, uh, examples of things that are not only beautiful, but functional. This is a brain coral from uh, scuba diving in Bon Air. Uh, beautiful structures. Here are some uh, stag coral, you know. And not only these, you know, they're obviously functional in their own way. So here in the ocean, these serve a purpose. Our fish populations, you know, use the coral, obviously, for all kinds of purposes. In, in our world, from a design standpoint, these structures, you know, are used in ways to provide, uh, to provide interesting things to look at. You know, so here, there's no real, probably real reason why that has to be a lattice. This was a church being rebuilt. A company called Fruth Innovation Technology Fit in Germany made this just recently. So I thought it was just interesting, and it, it looked like something uh, uh, bio, uh, you know, biomimicking, and, uh, and I put it in. But talking back to, you know, getting back to talking about the human body, we're, uh, the human body is amazing, you know, and it really is such a, a marvel, and not only because it's, it's clearly functional, but the form is interesting, but it's really, the form is only there for the function, you know, so the way we look the way we look, mostly because of the function that needs to, that needs to come out. And the same for all kinds of organs and internal structures, so 
here I thought of three kind of phases, and these are, these are indistinct. These aren't necessarily hard, hard, uh, hard lines, but we're seeing uh, additive being, uh, being used to kind of take, uh, to take and look at form, and then moving from form to thing with some functional properties, and kind of the, the holy grail, you know, the real long-term vision is the regenerative medicine piece. We're actually building body parts, pieces of your heart, pieces of your liver, pieces of your hip, that are actually gonna look like your hip and your liver and your heart when we put them back in. They're not gonna look like something else. So today, we do pretty well at mimicking, 3D printing does a pretty good job of mimicking these intricate forms and making, uh, making structures that are uh, mimicking the form of biologic structures that we find in nature and in the body. Um, and they serve a purpose. I, I think um, I'll talk a little bit in a, in a minute about the purpose they serve. But they also serve a purpose in kind of marketing, you know. So there are, uh, you know, this is a spinal cage on the right here. So these are, these are pieces to go in. If you've got a disc that's collapsed, they go in and they can put in something to kind of give space back to kind of prevent further collapse and other damage. And spine is one of the areas that's had a good uptick of 3D printing. So now there are maybe tens of thousands of these being made per year using additive technologies and using titanium and other materials that are friendly. Why, why does it matter? So back, uh, back in the 60s, um, this guy on the right, Perinmar Bronemark, was doing some experimentation and found that titanium and bone really liked each other. So he coined a term called osseointegration, which what they, what they found when they studied it is that bone and titanium grow together so tightly that there's hardly any interface. There's no interface. And most other materials, so if you took stainless steel or some other material and you put it in the body, you might get approximation, but you have a gap, some kind of a gap. So because you could get this tight interface, it, it allowed you to fixate things really well to the bone. So he's, he's the father of the, the uh, modern dental implant, where many of you in the room would probably have a dental implant post, and that is held in place by the bone growing really tightly with the titanium. So if we can apply, if we can apply porous structures, so say for a hip, you've got part of it going down into the femur and part of it up on the top. If you can put porous structures at the right places, you can get bone to grow into and around those and really lock it in place. And if you can lock implants in place, you get rid of one of the failure mechanisms for implants. So if you have a knee, you want it to be, you want it to be there. You want it to function, obviously, but you don't want it to get loose. Loose is bad. So here, putting porous in the right place at the right time. So in this case, we're obviously showing a personalized implant. Uh, this is putting porous right where we want to have porous. So they're putting porous here because of the fact that it approximates bone and they want bone to grow into it there. They're not putting it here because it's maybe there's some other issue and there's soft tissues or something else and they don't want that porous there. Uh, additive does a good job of allowing flexibility to do that whether you're making something personal or whether you're making something, you know, you're making 100,000 of these, no problem. So moving ahead, the second kind of phase is, is where you've got some mimicking properties. So we'd seen earlier this example of using the robot and, uh, and actually mimicking some of the physical properties of the kidney so that it's flexible, right? If you had a hard plastic kidney and a robot, it's not gonna feel the same. So you need it to feel the same. So, so that's one key. And on the right, you see, you know, there are now what they call digital materials. So there are processes that have been developed in 3D printing that allow for mixing, and mixing at a voxel level um, of different materials. So you could have different colors. By, say, CMYK, you could make a color rainbow. But you also could have flexible and rigid you know, and there'd be a different rainbow. So you could have different flexibilities. Or you could have things that were um, actually radiolucent or dense or, or of different things. So mimicking properties is kind of a key, a key area. Uh, you know, we get to talking really toward the third phase about the fact that what we put in today to replace the hip doesn't look anything like what we were given when we were born. You know, it doesn't, this doesn't look like it. Functionally, it, it can serve the same purpose, and it's got to be strong enough, and it's got to wear well, but it doesn't equal what we were given with. Um, and we've got ability here, so if we look again at, you know, the fact that we can make something that looks like a heart on the left 
doesn't mean that it's a heart, you know, on the right. So we have technology now that allows form, which is the additive piece. We can make the form. Uh, we also have technology and materials that can replicate function, right? So we have cells and we have materials that can that actually turn into different parts of the body that may be missing. But what do we do? How do we put those two together? So the putting of the two together really is the third phase, you know? And, and I think regenerative medicine, when you hear that term, is a broad term, but focused on making things that are going to be, in this, uh, in this area, things that look like the tissue they're replacing. So if you have a problem with your heart, you know, they're going to look like part of the heart. Now, there are different ways of, of going about this. I won't be able to cover this, but there are different ways of getting to different types of tissues. And the key is that the body's made up of a bunch, and there's not going to be one way to get there. And so we're going to have a bunch of different ways to get to different types of materials. And we're talking not only about replacement body parts, but also about organs. And the exponential, you know, the exponential uh, uh, thinking here is that the, these, these materials, many of them can be turned into, easily turned into paints. And here's showing some different things, different applications of turning those into paints. And things that are not only just uh, interesting and resorbable, but things that are actually conductive. So this is actually looking at something that's electric, electrically conductive, if you can believe it, uh, with graphene or graphite. So in conclusion, you know, talking back to why we started, personalization is, is, I think, key. And we see that we can be more personal with 3D printing, and it's a good fit for it. Um, I think that we've, uh, you know, we all would say that, you know, everyone deserves good quality medical care. And I think decentralization and democratization of manufacturing can uh, move us there. And really, the key toward biomimicry and this regenerative medicine kind of field in general is going to be powered by some of these 3D printing technologies. So it's been a pleasure to be with you today, and I look forward to talking with you some more.